Hello everyone, welcome back to another Woodworking Wisdom. Um, today we are looking at Arbitech and kind of power carving really. We've got three um, really cool things to look at. Um, and if you're into kind of power carving, chainsaw carving, these might kind of complement your, um, your work and also kind of give you access into areas that the chainsaw quite won't. Um, and also great for um, garden furniture, um, just, you know, cutting curves and freehand carving. Um, I really think this is a great system. Um, and, you know, really cool stuff. We've got a load of um, accessories and things like that that we can look at as well, um, if you're interested. Really want to concentrate on these three main ones today. So we've got the, um, the turbo plane, which um, I'll show you in a minute. It cuts really nice kind of flat surfaces. Great finish off of that tool. Um, we've got the power chisel. Again, kind of effortless carving um, with all the attachments that you would expect to see through your normal chisels and gouges if you're a um, hand carver. Um, and then the industrial wood carver. Um, before we even turn one of these on, though, there is a fair bit of safety chat we need to go through. Um, there's no denying it. Um, power carving is a is a really messy messy thing to do. Okay, um, we're going to be removing quite a lot of material and um, producing a lot of shavings and a lot of dust. Okay, so when we're kind of thinking about um, you know uh, doing something like this with a tool, a rotary tool like a grinder or something like that, be prepared for a lot of airborne dust because it's been so fast and it picks the shaving up and it throws it airborne pretty much instantly. So we really need to be careful about um, how we're protecting ourselves, what PPE we're using. Um, my kind of PPE of choice would be something like this, our respirator. Let's come on to, um, to camera two there, Steph. Great, thank you. Um, so a powered respirator, that filters all the air. Um, it's also impact resistant on the visor. So we're kind of killing two birds with one stone there. Really good bit of kit. Obviously, there's an expense to that. Um, and the very minimum, I would say, if you're getting into power carving or this type of rotary tool power carving, the, the kind of bigger scale of it, you want something like a visor and a dust mask. Um, FFP2 uh, for your dust mask, that's going to get rid of all the, all the kind of nasties in the air. Okay, so a little bit on safety. Also, you know, kind of consider what you're wearing. Usually in here, I've got a um, like a pinny on with a tie bow at the front. Um, but with this rotary tool, you know, there's the chance that that might get kind of grabbed in the, in the tool. So be careful what you're wearing, or not be careful what you're wearing, consider what you're wearing. Um, and I've got a smock on today. There's no kind of loose dangly bits. Hoodie drawstrings can always be, um, you know, dangerous. So just, you know, baggy jumpers, that sort of thing. We just want nice non-stretch uh, material. And then, you know, that reduces the chance of getting caught up on, on, on any of these tools. Um, so before you even start, before you even put the plug in, consider what you're wearing and consider that the space that you're in. You know, we used to do, um, we used to run courses in here, Windsor Chair being one of them, and we used to have three people using these Arbitex at the same time, and we would absolutely cover the room in shavings and dust. Um, so, you know, you've really got to be aware of that. If you're in your garage, uh, you know, you might want to throw some sheets up, but really I would say that this is a kind of outdoorsy thing, um, heading into spring now, um, you know, this is where these, these tools work the best is outside and we're not going to um, cover our workshop in dust. <laughs> um, you know, being a bit over precautious, but you know, that is really something you need to consider. Today we're, Steph, we're joined by Steph on the cameras and questions. So any questions that you have about any of these tools as we go along, um, you know, please put them in the comments. And I think Steph, we've, we've had a few emails this week. Um, so we've got some questions in the bag already. Okay. Thank you. Good stuff. So, I think we're going to start with the turbo plane, okay? Um, and this is actually fitted onto one of Arbitex grinders. Um, so, that's the grinder. 
you can see it's got the Arbitec tag on it. Um, this is the turbo plane. Um, and also, while we're talking about safety, none of this is plugged in. Okay, so all my grinders on the bench here are not plugged in while we're talking about them. We don't want to be putting our hands on the business area here and um, suddenly the, the grinder springs to life. The Arbitec one is really cool. It's got um, extraction, which you wouldn't normally get on a grinder. And that works really well. That's going to take away the majority of the kind of the nasty airborne dust. We're still going to throw a few chips around the place, um, but they're not the thing that's going to um, you know, cause us any problems. It's that dust, really. Um, so that extraction is going to pull the dust away. But that's on one of their kind of purpose-built grinders. Um, it's got some really nice features on it for a grinder. It's got um, a variable speed on the back here. Like I say, it's got that cowl on it for extraction. It's got a little um, kind of shock absorber, if you will. There's a little bit of flex and give because these, um, you know, do vibrate a lot in your hands. There's no getting around that. Okay. Um, we've got any questions then, Steph? Yeah. So one of the questions that came in, obviously you're showing that blade there on the Arbitec yep. kind of grinder. One of the questions was, um, can you fit the Arbitec blades to any grinder? Yeah, you can. Um, so when you buy the blades, um, they are um, they come with a, a set of bushings, and um, you know sometimes you'll need them for your grinder. Sometimes they'll fit straight on. Um, but yeah, you can fit them onto any grinder. Um, all of these grinders have the same kind of um, spindle on them um, with the same thread, um, and they seat really nicely. You usually get a couple of black plastic bushings. Um, to actually sit and um, kind of balance the blade properly or center the blade onto the spindle. Um, but yeah, the industrial wood carver, the, um, the turbo plane there, and lots of the mini um, kind of versions of, they just fit straight onto the spindle of, of any four and a half inch grinder. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Good stuff. Now, when I cut, I need to put my um, my helmet on, so we're going to um, just kill the um, the microphone for a little bit. Uh, we we tried to practice it with it in the helmet, but it just uh, it makes a funny noise. So um, what Steph's going to do is turn off the microphone while I'm cutting, and then if we get any questions, um, or I'll explain it um, what I've done afterwards. Okay, now so turbo plane. Let's have a look. Let's bring it over to our block of lime here. Good. So you can see on here, let's bring it up nice and close, a wide tungsten tooth running across here. Okay, really big bit of tungsten for a, for a grinder like this. Um, and we've got three of those, uh, it keeps it nicely balanced. The Arbitec grinder itself, you can see where the tooth, oh, let me come back a bit, where the tooth just pips up over the guarding here, you can just see it, just proud here. Um, so this guarding also acts almost like a limiter, so we're not taking off too much in one hit, um, but a really nice and balanced blade, really cool thing to use. Let's give you a nice close up of that one. All right, so we've got that wide tungsten tooth on there, and that's where it gets that kind of planing effect from. Okay, so. Let me put my helmet on. If you turn off the mic there, Steph. Great, thank you. Let me tuck that in. So we'll do an ear protection as well.
Okay. So I'm not sure if we can really see that on screen, but it gives a really nice, clean finish. In fact, I think I'm going to zoom in a little bit, Steph. If you can come onto camera one or two. Actually, I can't reach from there. Would you be able to come in just um, see me? Actually, I'll do it, Steph. I'll just come around this way. Didn't Otherwise, you'll far. see me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Let me just get my clock back in position. And... I am just going to zoom in. Okay. So if we pop back onto that camera three there, hopefully you can see where this has been rough sawn here. Um, we've got the, um, the bandsaw marks coming down here and we've got this kind of um, area here, which we've just skimmed and actually really kind of clean, not too much torn grain. We've got a little bit, we've got a little knot down here where it's just picked up on the end grain coming up. But otherwise, um, it, a really nice clean cut. Okay, a little bit of sanding and that would really kind of bring that home. All right. Okay. So I've got a question here from Hodgepodge. Um, he's asked, can the discs be sharpened or are they intended to be replaced? Yep, so certain ones. Oh, sorry, I've got left my helmet on there. The, um, the turbo plane, let me just unplug the, um, the grinder. So this wide tungsten tooth, if we come on camera three there, this wide tungsten tooth is resharpenable. Okay, um, what you would do is get something like a diamond file or diamond card. This is our little four-sided um, diamond hone. And use the highest grit on there. This is 320 um, on this one. And you would literally just hold that against the face, make sure it's seated nicely. I would take the blade off. Um, but if I get that spindle lock engaged, um, what you really want to do is go to the 320, and it would just be working that face there, okay, on, on the turbo plane. Make sure it's nice and flush and flat against that tooth. And do the same on each one. So if you do five um, swipes on that one, make sure you do five on here and five on here. And then you maintain the balance of the blade, okay? It's no good um, doing 10 on here and reducing that one because there's a slight chamfer to them. Um, if we did 10 on here, only these two teeth are going to engage on it. Um, so you can sharpen the, um, the turbo plane. The industrial wood carver. Now this is slightly different beastie. This has um, these kind of rounded carbide cutters. Okay. Um, now with those, you can undo this little um, screw here and just rotate them. So you, you've probably got kind of four, uh, well, it's a circle, so it's not four corners, but four places in which it will take a fresh cut. Um, and this will last for a long time. Um, but you can undo that, rotate it through 90 degrees, and I would put a little pen mark on there so I knew which way it's gone or where's, where the blunt area is. And, um, and just rotate them, and I reckon you'd get probably four or five um, goes at a, a sharp bit and then they're replaceable and it's just those tips. Okay, the, um, the power chisel, so this one, um, you would just sharpen these like you would any kind of um, chisel, any carving tool um, on a strop. I use um, Tormek a lot, um, but you could do these on the ultimate edge, any of those type of um, tops, or even just a strop. Just keep it honed that way. Okay. So we've got a question here from Frederick. He's asked, how do you determine what speed to grind at being a variable speed tool? So um, they'll have the, um, the max RPM on the blades. Um, that's all printed on there. Um, these are 1,200. Um, oh, sorry. Sorry, 12,000 RPM these run at. Um, so the Arbitec with the um, turbo plane on, you just run flat out. Um, what I should say is this this one here, you can get a sanding head for it. Um, you get a soft sanding head. That's the one. So the variable speed really um, comes into play 
when we're um, using things like this, where we want to bring that speed down uh, for finishing and for sanding. Um, so that really is to be used in the, the speed control is to be used in conjunction with something like um, one of these soft sanding pads. Um, and exactly the same um, size as the turbo plane. So if we're kind of cur cutting a curve or, um, you know, like a, a scallop, then that, um, that sanding pad's going to come right in and follow exactly this. It's got exactly the same diameter. Um, so you get a really good good finish off of that. All right. Cool. So we've got a question here from Fuller saying, how do the discs attach to the spindle? Um, are they threaded? And if so, what is the thread size? I'm not sure on the thread size. I think it's a common one across all grinders. But um, let me just double check that that's turned off. So changing the discs. Actually, let's come on to camera two, I think might be easier. Changing the disc on any grinder um, it just just works off the um, off the lock nut like you would on a normal grinding wheel. So um, you've got your um, spindle lock in underneath here. So I'm pressing that one in. Rotate the blade till you feel it kind of click into place, and then you've got your two pronged um, spanner. Um, and what I would do if I was taking this off, if you see, if I lay it across there, we're in um potentially gonna hit this um tooth here and let's come on back onto camera three thanks steph just changed that for us or we weren't looking um so if you were to lay your spanner across there you're in danger of um you know fouling on that tungsten tooth here so i would lay it across that way where we're clear of all the teeth and then you just undo that one this nut comes off and then you put whatever blade on and do it back up. And underneath there, we've got um, we've got some little bushings. Okay, good stuff. So um, I've had a question from Nigel here. Can those circular cutters be removed and sharpened by rubbing them on a diamond card after they've been rotated and blunted on all edges? Um, so I wouldn't go trying to um, dress the outside of those. Um, those kind of cone shaped tips you can get these diamond cones um, which will, will go on in, into the little chamfer um, and they can sometimes dress them but i think really once you've um you know been around that that circle um and blunted all sides i think it's time for for like a fresh set um you know that there, there is a little price to all of these um these tools they're they're not they're not cheap um but they work so well. And if you're, um, you know, if you're counting time as, um, as a commodity, if your time, you know, for us that do this hobbies, you know, time isn't really a factor, but if you're making stuff that you need to sell, these things will pay for themselves in no time in, 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 um, in time saved because, um, you know, like I say, we we used to make lots of Windsor chairs, and the hand tooling part it was really hard work. I think um, you know we've got a lot to learn from our um, predecessors using all the kind of hand tools and um, you know working those muscle groups and things like that. It is surprising how um, how much hard work goes into hand tooling, and if you see these um, you know handmade chairs that are one two three thousand pounds that's because of the time that they've put into it the skills and years of um you know um they, they've taken to master all of these things um so that's kind of what you're paying for with these they kind of horse the material off so quick if you were making outdoor benches if you were you know sculpting tree stumps or you know making them into chairs big swing chairs, um, these sorts of things, you know, they will cut your um, your working time in at least half, probably more. Um, so they, you know, whilst there's a cost to them, um, they are um, very efficient in the way that they work and it will save you time in, um, in work time. All right, good.
so we just flattened off there we just used a little bit and you can already see that the bench is covered in shavings um you know i've got my air filter on here um and also you know i'm doing a demo today so i'm i'm a bit wary of taking blades off and swapping them over because my concentration's not there because i'm answering questions um because I'm dipping in and out of different tools, um, I'm not going to be removing blades and putting them back on because, um, you know, that slight lapse in concentration, um, it might mean that it could come a cropper on some of this stuff. Um, so for today's purposes, I'm keeping the, um, the blades on the grinders, um, but only because we're, we're kind of talking, I'm a little bit distracted. Um, you know, absolutely, you can swap these, um, swap these out. Um, but I'm lucky enough to have a dedicated grinder for each of these um, each of these tools. Okay, so I'm going to go back in, Steph. I'm going to do a little uh, another little cut with this um, uh, with the turbo plane, and I'm going to create a little scallop across um, across the top of this piece of lime. Okay. Just had a little comment, Ben, saying that the camera above you isn't very focused, which is probably my fault. So in a minute, I'll have a little jiggle. Okay. Yeah. Was it not an autofocus? Um. So you, again, you can't really see how much of a scallop I've made there. If I tip the board up, you get to see it a little bit more. But actually, that's fairly deep. That's probably you know a good 15, 20 mil deep, um, just in those few seconds. And you can imagine doing, um, you know, those kind of sharing boards uh, where you could put different, you know, your peanuts and your crisps or something like that in. Really quick way of, of removing material. And actually the finish in the bottom of there, I know I've been a bit rough on the ends, but with a little bit more time and care, um, you can make some really interesting shapes and hardly any sanding to do. That's why I really kind of love this tool. Um, you've got great control on it, and um, yeah, it, it really takes material away quite quickly. So that's a little bit on the on the turbo plane. Um, okay, so another question. I was just going to say one of the questions that was previously sent in was, um, can you use um, the Arpitec blades on wet and dry timber? You can, yeah. Um, so wet timber is going to be a little bit more kind of fibrous um so when you make these cuts um you'll probably find you'll have lots of kind of fluff like stragglers um coming in but you know you can sand them back um obviously when it's wet you're taking out a lot of the kind of um sh inherent stress in the wood um so when it as it dries it's probably going to kind of deform a little bit as it dries um whatever it is that you're making um, it's likely to split and things like that as well. So um, you can use them on wet timbers, um, a little bit messy. Again, you wouldn't have all this dust in the air, which is a, a, 
a bonus. Um, but you've got that kind of fluffy uh, material, and you've also got to contend with uh, resin in the cleanup. So the cleanup of the tools um, could could be a bit annoying because um, you know that that kind of sticky resin um, and the heat of friction, the, the two combined can really kind of um, fuse the resin onto the blades. Um, but yeah, of course you can. It's just a bit of a pain cleaning up, but that's a lot of, um, like a lot of um, disciplines with, with wet timber. Okay. Um, so turbo plane, really good for, for flattening off things. Um, they actually do um, like a jig as well that you can um, set the depth on, on the turbo plane. So you can only, you know, you can only take off high spots and things like that. Um, so that's a really good, neat little tool. But really good for flattening things off. A great finish on the tool. And um, yeah, it works so quickly. It's what we do all of our Windsor chair seats in. So... All of these kind of hollows in here, um, you know, that's all done with Arbitec. Um, we have been on there with the hand tools as well, but you can see that kind of sculpted look. We've got that kind of rise and fall across the front. Really quick way to um, to do things like your Windsor chairs, swing seats, all that kind of stuff. Okay, another question. So I've got a question from Steve Ash here. He's asked, how easy is it to adjust the width of the cut? Like if you wanted to do an octoplot, he's got octoplot body uh, mm -hmm. to smaller tentacles. So I guess octopus down to smaller tentacles, how easy is that? So I wouldn't use something like this, especially for those um, kind of tentacles. They're going to be really vulnerable at their extremes. As soon as you get kind of two inch two or three inches away from the main body the main bulk of the um of your octopus or whatever it is that you're carving um this the way it works that rotary action is gonna um you know kind of the teeth's gonna come around and, and hit it a little bit and it's probably gonna uh, break those off um for things like your tentacles you probably want to downsize a little bit um you know start off cutting them as best you can on a, on the bandsaw scroll saw and then um, bring in probably a smaller rotary bird to do something like that. A little bit too aggressive, this, um, this tool. Um, and the industrial wood carver even more so. That's, um, you know, really, really designed to, um, you know, the horse material off quickly um, it, to, um, you know, almost the roughing out stage of, of your carving. Um, so you would probably have to carve the whole thing with the tentacles all joined together as one piece of wood. Um, that would be fine, really free-flowing curves and stuff with a tool like this. But to separate out those little um, tentacles, um, you would need something a lot less aggressive than, uh, than a tool like this. Okay. Terry Bones asked if he can see me on, in front of the camera. Who's um, that? Terry Bones. <laughs> okay yeah if you make your way Come to make a central yeah. terry then you'll see me because i'll be there doing the cameras and questions that's and make a right. central <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's cool. definitely we'll keep her under wraps for the time for you. it'll be a surprise <laughs> <laughs> good stuff okay um so another thing just a quick thing it's just popped into my head these um these tools just double checking it's um plugged let's come back onto our overhead camera here steph Lovely, thank you. Actually, on edge here, there is the, the tooth kind of runs runs out on edge. Um, so what that means is we could have a template, something like this. Obviously not your hand. Let me even take that away just because it's silly. Um, a template that you could work around. So something that had a, a gentle curve. I'm just going to grab something. Sorry. Hadn't occurred to me earlier. But, uh, you know, this is a really cool... Um, feature of this tool that if you had something like this a template you could run that disc up against that template and and carve that shape okay and it'd be so crisp and lovely around there um, so you can use templates and guides um, with this kind of tool because it doesn't cut on edge all right and that can be a nice limiter as well if you're um, using it up on its side if you tip it that little bit further 
you can kind of fade out cuts and things. So a really kind of unique um, and lovely kind of user-friendly um, tool, that one. Highly recommend that, especially if you're doing chairs, seats, anything with a kind of um, a, a, a shallow hollow um, or even, you know, a deep one. I've seen some really cool laminated benches that um, have got some huge curves on which have been done uh, with Arbitech. All right, so another question. So I've got Nigel here. He's asked, he's got an angle grinder with a diamond edge blade. Would mm -hmm. the would that be usable as a wood carving tool? Probably not. The um the diamond cutters are usually for um for stone, um for tiles and things like that. Um probably not. Uh, I think the 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 um they're they're really good at a straight cut or a plunging cut when you want to start putting sidewards pressure on a on something on a disc like that they would crumble um and especially those kind of metal cutting discs that you you find like the small ones you get with like dremels and stuff i wouldn't bring them near a piece of wood um you really want something um with with a, a bigger tooth on that that's gonna clear waste as it goes um so I wouldn't recommend the um, the diamond ones, and you're likely to get some burning off of that as well because the the the, um, the heat of friction and the, each one of those little diamonds not taking away enough material, it's going to kind of um, clog and, and burn a little bit. That's what I would I would expect, but um, you know I, I'm only talking through um, uh, educated guess. <laughs> okay. That's it for Good. questions at the moment, but Hodgepodge thinks that I'm just Colwyn talking in the female <laughs> Yeah, got he the wishes. voice box. Huh? He wishes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good stuff. Um, right. What are we looking at next, Steph? Um, let's have a look at the industrial wood carver because this thing is really cool. Um, again, I need to get my helmet on, so we're going to power off the mic and, um, and have a go with this one. Nigel says he likes the look of this cutter. Yeah, this one's a beast. <laughs> this one works really well, really fast. Again, messy, um, but it works really well. And you can see how fast that took that little scallop out of here. Um, if we come back onto camera three, um, it just whips the material off. Um, and that is probably... We've gone about an inch deep from the corner here um, and a, a sort of two inch wide cut. And, you know, 
the material's on the floor. Um, it's kind of thrown it down. <clears throat> but really, again, just takes that material off real quick. Um, and it's a really good finish. Let me bring this up closer to Cam so you can have a good look. You can see in the middle of those scallops that almost kind of burnished look that the um, the cut has given. Obviously, it's a little bit lumpy and bumpy where we, we've kind of done parallel cuts to each other. Um, but actually, in the middle of those cuts, where it, where it counts, um, we've got a really nice, clean um, cut. There we go. You can see what the turbo plane, the finish of the turbo planes left. Um, so really good finish off of these tools. And... Um, and, you know, that saves on cleanup and stuff. One thing I haven't mentioned about, again, banging on about safety. If you're working on something with one of these tools, make sure it's really well held, either in a bench vise with some dogs, um, but really give it a good wiggle. Make sure it's not going to um, not going to go anywhere. Okay. Um, and also, just a little bit on technique. Oh, sorry, my mic's falling out the back here. Just going to quickly <laughs> put that somewhere where it's going to um, hold on. Um, oh dear. So, a little bit on technique. What I tend to do is bring my elbows in, not lock them rigid, but bring them into your body. Both hands on the grinder at all times. Um, when you switch it on, so let's come on to, to camera three a second. When you switch it on, um, you need both hands on the grinder. Okay, don't be tempted to switch it on like that. These are, you know, these have a soft start, but some grinders won't, and they'll kick when you turn them on. So if we go back to camera one, Steph, lovely. So bring your elbows in. Your wrists are still doing the work. They're doing, um, you know, the kind of... Um, the positioning of the tool, if you will, but those elbows and shoulders aren't doing much work. We don't need too many pivot points, otherwise things, you know, you can get little catches and things. Um, and so really important we keep the workpiece really well held and keep those elbows in and, you know, work on the piece. And if you need to sway your body, you know, it's better to do that. You've got more kind of strength in your core than if than to do that okay so more kind of um like that and less of that all right that kind of leads perfectly on to really we've had a question from malcolm he's asked do you need a lot of arm strength to hold and control the cut the cutter um but i guess obviously if you're going from the core um i would say a more kind of hand strength um, like all of these things, you it does you do build fatigue, especially in all that kind of safety gear. Um, it can get quite hot and quite hard to communicate. So if you're doing something like this, um, make sure that the you know you've got someone who's got your back. So you say you know I'm off down the shed or into the garage. I'm using my Arbor Tech. Um, if you come in, don't tap me on the shoulder. So I turn around and say, "Oh, is that?" You know, you get the idea. We want um, we want people to be aware of what we're doing, um, and to not kind of scare you. Also, if they tap you on the back because you can't hear anything and you're kind of concentrating on what's in front of you, um, just you know, whoever whoever has um, got your back, just tell them that um, you know I'm using this. Um, don't scare me. Um, don't be stood near a door where a door could swing open and hit you. Um, really important to kind of get your surroundings um, safe first. Sorry, Steph, what was the original question? I rambled off a bit there. About arm strength. Arm strength. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, not, not so much arm strength. I'd say uh, more in your grip. You need a good grip for these sorts of things. So if you're suffering, um, you know, with um, arthritis or anything like that, um, this might be a tool um, that you want to give a miss. It's, um, yeah, more about grip than arms and shoulders and stuff. Because, like I say, you can lock all that up and kind of sway your body a little bit. Um, but you do need a good grip of the tool. 
Someone's asked if you're going to be demonstrating the ball gouge today. The ball gouge. We have got a ball gouge. We'll have a look at that. Yeah, for sure. Um, we're happy with that kind of um, industrial carver. Like I say, the real workhorse out of the group, that one. Um, we can Let's have a look at the ball gouge next. The ball gouge, I should say. Not a ball gouge. <laughs> So what are we doing? Let's plug that one in here. So we've got a ball gouge here. If I just leave it there and we can plug it in, you can have a look at that. Um, another quick tip. Um, make sure that the grinder isn't on when you plug it in. Okay. Again, just through experience, if people plug these in and the, the, the um, you know, the tool is on, it either shoots across the room on its on its wheel or um, it's going to do, <coughs> do some damage to your bench or even worse yourself. Make sure that the grind is turned off before plugging it in. All right, another question. Um, so we've had a question from James here. What sort of catches do you get with these tools and do they dig in? Um, so the, you can, if you present them at the wrong angle, um, they, they can dig, they can grab. Um, what I find, um, if we, probably not so much on the ball gouge, let me just pop that to one side, that is plugged in, so we won't mess with that. Um, oops. Um, let's use the turbo plane as an example. So let's come on to camera three there. The turbo plane, if we think of the body of the uh, grinder kind of um, as 12 o'clock, Okay, so the um, you know the the length of the body is um, your twelve and six o'clock. Um, these like to be worked between twelve and three. Okay, so it's this top kind of quadrant of the um, of the cutter. All right, and if we look at the guarding, that's kind of telling us where it wants to be worked um, between this area here. You can use these flat. Um, they you know they are, they're supposed to be used flat to be to get that balance. I tend to um, just bring the um, the tool to workpiece, and I tend to just put a little angle. So the grinder is kind of tipping down at one o'clock or two o'clock, somewhere in that area, and that's where they like to be worked. That is always in reference to the grinder being straight there. So if you, of course, if you twist the grinder, which is no problem with that, that 12 o'clock comes around with it, and your 12 and 3 is in this position now. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, But they like to be worked on that top um, right-hand corner. All right. Okay, and it's the same with the ball gouge, actually. Um, let's have a go with this one. Again, this is cool for, like, um, uh, spoon bowls. For, for other kind of bigger vessels and stuff. And I'll show you some stuff that we've made with this one in a minute. So, mic off. Thank Really. 
can't really see much with it at that angle. The light is kind of hitting at a funny angle. But if I was to tip that up, you can see the shadow it's created, how quick that removed that material. And if you've got like a blank and you want to do a load of spoons, you know, you can have your kind of spoon shape coming around this way and you've got a bigger blank. So excuse my crude drawing. If you, um, you know, you've got a load of spoons set up, um, really easy just to kind of whip them out with this uh, ball gouge and, um, and then cut them on the bandsaw, um, scroll saw, whatever, whatever you've got, a coping saw. Um, so really nice way to quickly um, create like uh, bowls and, and things like that. Um, and it's really good for like undercuts as well. Let me show you uh, this one. <laughs> Sorry, it filled it with shavings. So um, really nice thing here. Um, you see it's all undercut there. Um, it's got this big kind of um, uh, undercut. But that's all done on the bowl gouge, uh, ball gouge, sorry, slip of the tongue. Uh, really nice um, organic shapes. Um, and really, you can get really deep in under some of these, um, you know, this kind of lip, if you will. So that's a nice little thing. Um, again, uh, spoon bowls. So that was done with the, with the ball gouge and then cut out and shaped. Um, so, you know, this tool, this ball gouge is going to, you know, there's not many tools that would, would cut something like that. So let's go back onto camera three. Sorry. There's not many tools that would cut anything like this. Um, you know, uh, perhaps um, small burrs on a, um, on a little rotary tool or something, but nothing that's going to cut it that quickly and cleanly. Um, so really cool um, shapes. And, and really odd shapes actually really strange ones to kind of um you know if, if you've got a particular job that needs um something like that um the ball gouges are a really good thing this was done with the others the um um the <laughs> turbo plane and the industrial wood carver um and you can see how deep that is we've got like a bread um I forget what they call these now trough or something yeah something like that um, but yeah really nice and deep and quick and easy all right okay so another question we've had a question here from simon he's asked can you resharpen the ball gouge cutters so the ball gouge um it says it sharpens itself i'm not quite convinced but um they do say it's self-sharpening and I think it's the way it runs as the kind of um, the cutting edge comes in. Um, the kind of back edge is being kind of polished as it goes. Um, I'm not quite convinced on the science of that. But again, just like the, um, the smaller teeth, let me, let me take that one out. I'll take the plug out and come on to camera three. Um, just like those smaller tungsten teeth we had on the... Um, on the industrial carver, this ball gouge has a um, a little um, hex bolt in there. You take that off, this top bit comes off, and then that ring is replaceable or rotatable. So same thing, if you're working it in a certain area, um, you can rotate it through 90 degrees and you get that new sharp edge. I All guess right. the question is, have you ever had any issues with it being sharp? Not really. I don't think this has traveled all the way around its, its sharp edge yet. So we've never had to um, consider sharpening it at all. It is flat and it's almost, the way it works is almost like, um, like a bowl gouge. It's got a bevel on it, which, um, which needs to be in contact. You need that bevel rubbing like we do in wood turning. So the way we present it, it's almost flat onto the workpiece, but because the blade is at an angle, that you know it presents that cutting edge. Um, but yeah, this won't cut straight down, so you can't um, kind of bore down with this one. It needs to just kick over an edge on an angle um, and have that bevel rubbing. 
Okay, the miniature version, which I think we'll look at um, another time because we're coming up to time. Um, there is a miniature version in the um, precision carving system that will go straight down. You can plunge it. Okay, so this is a really nice little tool. This one, I love this one. Um, that is the miniature um, ball gouge, and it comes in a set with a thing that looks a bit like a router cutter. Okay. I've had a play with this one. Not as much success with this one yet, but I'm sure it's just because um, I'm I'm not doing the right type of job with it. Um, it's got that kind of sheer cut and um, almost like a plunge cutting router piece um, on that end. And then also it comes with a little, um, little sanding attachment. Okay, a little sanding head and an arbor that carries all of these. Okay, so they'll go into the arbor and then that fits on the spindle of your um, your grinder. Okay, so another question. So Simon's asked, um, are any of the other cutters self-sharpening? No, I think it's just these ball gouges. Um, and... Yeah, I, I, I can't get, I can't think of the science behind it, but, um, you know, I, I'm assured that it is uh, self-sharpening, um, but I think eventually you're going to have to replace that, um, that ring. Okay, so let's pop them to one side. What else do we want to have a look at? Let's have a quick look at, before we sign off, let's have a quick look at the, um, the power chisel, because again, this is another tool I really like. Um, Let's flip this over, get a bit more of a working space. So I've got a big chunk of lime here, and don't worry, this won't be wasted. I'll carve this into something else. So get it in the vise, give it a wiggle, give it a shake. If the whole bench shakes with it, you're good, all right? Um, I don't need my um, full visor this time. I can go with goggles, um, but I will use hearing protection because it is kind of working on a on a slim body grinder again. Um, this is the uh, power chisel, and this one has got a reciprocating head, um, but it works off a cam. So it's rotary still down here, and that's just driving an arm up and down here. Um, and it doesn't actually engage until you put pressure on it. So it's a really cool tool. This is gonna be um, loud, Steph, yeah. So if we turn that mic. You might want to protect your ears a little bit. Put your hands on. Thank clearly see how easy that is, how it just quickly whizzes through the timber. Um, as I'm not putting hardly any kind of force on that. If I try and do it by hand, it's kind of digging there. Um, but that um, reciprocating head... you can really quickly build up really cool textures um, you can get right down amongst it if you've got like um, you know something really chair because I keep feeling I'm gonna back onto it let's pop that down here so I'm just gonna follow this little squiggly line So again, I'm going to hold that up to camera. Um, 
this is a really nice kind of safe, user-friendly tool. Let me just show that up nice and close to camera so you can see how clean and, um, and nice that cut is. No cleanup to do on that. That um, chisel is just cut through that like butter. You can see those deeper cuts there again, all clean bottomed on um, down, you know, right down in the bottom of that V. Um, we don't need to get in there with abrasives or files or anything. A really nice clean cutting tool. Okay, so you can see how that works. Um, you know, what you do with carving, uh, that's totally, you know, there's, there's so much you can do with it. And of course, that comes in all different shapes. You can get all different cutters for it, just like you would expect from um, your carving gouges and things like that. All different shapes. We've got V's and various sweeps on these uh, rounded ones. We've got flat chisels because, again, if you want to take the edge off of something or do a straight cut in, um, stop cuts and things like that. Um, but, yeah, you can get loads of different chisel heads for it. Um, really easy to swap them over. You've just got this button on the back here. That pretty much brings out the tool that you're using and then you put the next one in let's put that one in because it looks a bit and you should feel it kind of click and then it's locked in there and again you can turn this on and it's not gonna it's not going in and out it's only when you put that bit of backwards pressure on the chisel that it engages on that um on that cam wheel and starts um that reciprocating head going okay sorry even i'm interested by that that sounded really quite cool <laughs> um so we've had a question from fuller does the power chisel adapter ever need any lubrication it does it's got a little um what they call a nipple down in here and it's right on that cam thing we saw this earlier it's it comes with it um but yeah it just goes on a little uh sorry a little nipple at the back here Okay, on the back of the, um, on there, you can't really see it. Let's bring it up close. There's a little gap in there uh, where the lubrication goes in. And we thought this was a bottle of that um, joke blood when we saw it, because it looks really red, really kind of red color. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it's a lubricant that comes with the power chisel. Um, really, really nice tool, this one. I love to use it. Um, it's really cool um, and just so user friendly and intuitive um, you know you get that in your hands um, the, the, although it makes a loud noise the vibration isn't much it's certainly not as much as the as the grinders um, so you can use it for long periods of time it's very light it's not um, you know it's not gonna cause fatigue um, so quickly and certainly easier than um, you know the traditional um, chisels and mallets and things like that. Um, so, uh, love that tool. Okay, we good? We're good, I think, yeah. Lovely. Well, thank you for all your questions today. Um, we'll probably revisit Arb Tech in a, in, um, in a while. Um, once the sun starts shining, we can get outside and create a lot more mess, which means, um, you know, we can use these tools for a bit more of an extended period um, and, and carve something really cool. Um, in here, I'm just going to fill the place with dust or, or shavings. Um, but yeah, um, you know, we will revisit these because there's some other cool attachments. You get a mini turbo plane. We get um, the kind of soft sanding heads and things like that, which are really cool and unique to to Arbitech. Um, really had a good look at power carving the company. And, um, you know, filled lots of little gaps where, um, you know, lots of other tools aren't reaching or can't quite get into. Um, so they're really cool, worth a look. Remember your safety. So remember um, airborne dust. We get something like a dust filter or just do it outside. Make sure you've got your dust mask or something like a respirator. Um, make sure you've got full face covering with the rotary tools. Not so much with the power chisel, but if you're using those rotary tools, make sure you've got full face covering and secure that workpiece. Make sure it's not shifting anywhere. Um, you know, that again can be a danger if it shifts, 
that's not so bad thing but what it might do is present more timber onto the cutter and then you know you've suddenly got a big catch think safety make sure your um grinders are turned off when you're plugging them in i know all these things are, are probably um you know seem like common sense but just make sure you do those physical checks yourself and um, and make sure you're happy with um, what's going on. If you're changing between different cutters, make sure everything's done up nice and tight um, before you start using them. Okay. So that's a little look at Arbor Tech. Um, come back next week. We've got more woodworking wisdom. If you've enjoyed this video, give us a like and a subscribe um, and we'll see you again very soon.